To him be the glory. We're to preach the whole counsel of God. And until we have ministers and churches that, and pastors and theologians that submit to the Bible and want to faithfully teach the Bible, then we'll have these smarmy clever clogs in the seminaries and smarmy clever clogs in the ministry, but they'll have no power, and there'll be no fire, and there'll be no revival. Holy fire, Holy Spirit fire. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Matthew 10, verse 16. Oh yeah, I'm just getting a bit tired. One of the things, the way the liberals and these, i come back because I, I was just getting tired and I, I forgot my point, my main point there. But the way these liberals and, and smarmy pastors and bishops and writers and theologians try to undermine orthodoxy is this. One of the things is, number one, they say, the orthodox are not actually biblical. We're biblical. And number two, they'll say, well, they've just been brought up like that. They've not really thought it through. And that's the way they try to undermine orthodoxy. So basically, when they meet an orthodox Christian or evangelical, they'll say, you're not really... You know, you only believe this because you've been brought up with it. So automatically, what they're trying to predispose you to do is to actually to look at their opinion in a fresh way and to undermine your faith. And they also assume that you're not intelligent enough to have studied the topic yourself, you see. So beware when they start to come and say these things. And when they start to say they're biblical and the orthodox are not. Because actually, they're the ones that are not biblical. And actually, they're the ones that don't look at the arguments in a deep way. They don't really want to look at the people who believe in the doctrine of hell. Any argument, any evidence that they bring who believe in the doctrine of hell, they just brush under the carpet. They don't want to look at it. So beware of this kind of idea. Oh, they'll say it. The minister will say to you, well, you were brought up that way to believe that, weren't you, really? And in a way, they're getting you then to look in a fresh way at their opinion. But now they're opening you to doubt. They're opening you to heresy. And you are swallowing it. Okay? you just got to recognise. When they say these people are not biblical, but we're biblical, you got to think, wait a minute, there's plain scripture here and they're just ignoring it. This is, they're not speaking the truth, okay? I'm just going to drink the water. Amen. So we're nearly finished now. So, uh, Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth the sheep in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But when they persecute you in this city, flee for another, for verily I said to you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man become. The reason why I quote that scripture is the Lord is saying, go out and preach. But you're not going to be accepted, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be killed, you're going to be slandered and attacked. So, trying to water down the gospel will stop you from being persecuted. But when you're preaching a true doctrine of hell, you will be attacked and you will be slandered. And there's more that I could actually give, there's, there's lots of other verses, but I... I just want to deal with um, a couple of final issues that people bring up. We could look at more verses, um, but I think we've looked at a few verses that really just show that the doctrine is not actually uh, correct, that 
those who believe in annihilationism, universalism, there are just a few verses from Matthew show clearly that that's not the case. And I've got lots of notes here that I could go into, but um, I just want to focus on a couple of things that the annihilationists say. Annihilationism is more subtle than universalism. Universalism, a five-year-old child can spot and know that it's not right. But annihilationism is a bit more difficult to spot because what the annihilationist does, they actually use the same language as the people who believe in hell. But they don't believe in hell. But yet they use the same kind of language as those who believe in hell. So it kind of can be a bit confusing. Um, so you tend to find that um, th this is the case. So, so now just a few points here. The annihilationists use the word perish, destroy and death. And they say that the words perish, the word destroy, the word death means annihilationism. But if you look at the Young's Concordance and study the word perish, destroy and death, it doesn't, most of the time it doesn't actually mean um, what the annihilation is saying. It doesn't, actually, doesn't necessarily mean perish as in annihilation, destroy as in annihilation or death as in annihilation. It, um, I'm just looking, they, they have, they can, they have the idea, um, I'm just trying to look at my notes here. Let's just look at Matthew 26, 8. Let's just look at some... Uh, Matthew 9, 17. Matthew 9, 17. And we'll, just, we'll get an, an idea. 9, 17. Neither do men put new wine in old wineskins, else the wineskins break and the wine runneth out. And the wineskins perish. So here's the word perish. The, the annihilationists use the word perish and it means annihilated. But here's the word perish being used here. Neither do men put new wine into old wineskins. Else the wines break and the wine runneth out. And the wineskins perish. But they put new wine and new wineskins and both are perceived. Now, it says the wineskins perish. That doesn't mean they're annihilated, it just means they burst, but they're not annihilated. They perish, alright? So that's an example where the, the annihilationists who deny the doctrine of hell, they say, look, the word perish means annihilated. Well, here's the word perish you're being used concerning wise games, and it doesn't mean they're annihilated. So you've got to be careful because there are some verses like John 3, 16, 17, and, and reading on, and, the, and they'll get... Uh, none shall perish and they go, ah, look, it means that they're, they're annihilated. But we've just shown that the word perish doesn't necessarily mean annihilated. And very often, these Greek words of perish, destroy and death don't mean the, the, way, the, 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 the implication and the teaching. The vast majority of these words don't mean what the annihilationist means. And I would encourage you to look at the Young's Concordance on the, on the Hebrew and Greek words of perish, destroy and death. Okay, so that's just on semantics. Now, I want to look at one final point, Revelation 20, 14. Revelation 20, 14. Also, um, as we go to Revelation uh, 14. Mm. 
Revelation uh, 2014. Revelation 2014. Revelation 2014. So here it says, And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So annihilationists who believe that when you die you're just dead and that's it. They say, look, and death and hate were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So that's annihilationism. But look, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And what he's saying there, that death and hate were cast into the lake of fire, is saying, look, death will be no more. You're going to hell fire and death is swallowed up in hellfire. In other words, you're not going to die anymore. You're going to be in hellfire. That's what it's meaning. Yet the annihilationists will twist that passage and say it teaches annihilationism. That people just are dead and that's it. They're never going to suffer torment. You see? So you've got to... Get everything in context. Get everything in context. So that's a passage that annihilation is used quite well. The other one that they use is uh, the one where it talks about uh, and do not fear man but fear God who can destroy destroy the body and soul in hell. All right. Now notice body and soul in hell. Destroy body and soul. If you do a study of the word soul, the soul is eternal. So when he says, destroy both body and soul in hell, even if you just do a study on the doctrine of the soul, the soul is not annihilated. So when he says, destroy body and soul in hell, doesn't mean that the soul gets annihilated in hell. It means the body and soul come together and are destroyed in a punishment in hell. The word destroy there is, is being interpreted by the annihilationists as in complete annihilation. The word destroyed, if you look at Young's Concordance, doesn't generally mean destroy as in annihilating, but destroy as in the quality of life. Okay, so you've got to be so careful because the annihilationists take words out of context. So let's go to Psalm 90 and then we're finished. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. So. It says in Psalm 90, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of man. For a thousand years in thy sight are but a yesterday, when it is past, and as watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, and they are like a sleep in the morning, and they are grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth, and groweth up, and in the evening it cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thy anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in the wrath, and we spend our years as a table that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they fourscore years, yet in the strength of labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thy anger? This is the verse. Who knoweth the power of thy anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Modern man, since the 19th and 20th century, has created a God in its own image. The church has created a sentimental Father God who is sentimental, sweet and kind, who solve all your psychological and emotional and physical problems, will not judge you for your sin, but has just come to patch you up emotionally and to get all the rubbish out of your life. This is not the God of the Bible, it's an idol created by modern man. 
which is now trying to be made to become orthodoxy within the Church of Jesus Christ. But the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ is that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be an unending torment, a judgment for every sin that we've committed, but it will last for eternity. Men and women will be cast into outer darkness. There will be a fire, and the fire represents the wrath of God. So powerful that we cannot even contemplate it, so fire is used as the symbol. Within that fire and within that outer darkness, there will be no hope and it will last forever. And it's a terrible prospect. But when Christ came, he died and took the wrath that we deserve to save us from hellfire. So that we may be forgiven. The most loving thing that you can do is to share that gospel to people. Because if they do not turn to the Lord, they are lost forever. How great a responsibility do you have as a minister of the gospel? How great a responsibility do you have as office bearers of the church? How great a responsibility do you have as a Christian to go into the highways and byways and share this message of salvation, of God's amazing rich love, that he came and shed his blood for you and me. But if you deny this doctrine, it will not be long within the next 10 years, if you deny it as a minister, where you will deny the atonement and you will deny sin, and the church will live a careless, ungodly life. And the church will lose its fervour. The church will become secular. And you as a Christian, if be you were a Christian, you will just become really a sentimental, secular, socialist, but you won't be a, a, an evangelical born again Christian. Forgive me for my passion, forgive me for uh, my fervour and zeal. The doctrine of hell has solemn, sol solemnly affected my life today and has changed me beyond recognition. It has made me more fearful of walking in sin. It has made me know the riches of God's love. It has fired my heart to preach the word and fired my heart to reach the lost. And it has made me a lion to defend the faith and fear no man. So forgive me for my passion if I went too far. But it came from a heart that has been affected by this doctrine. You may not like it. You may feel it's unjust. Number one, Jesus taught it. And number two, it will be just according to God's justice. And who are you to judge and say what God is doing is wrong? We've seen in the history of the church and the history of Western civilization from my talk that when you reject the doctrine of hell and live in hell, erupts upon the earth. Hell is a restraint against sin. Hell is a, a place of punishment deserving for sin. There are other aspects of hell that we could study. There are actually degrees of hell in the sense of uh, Al Martin talks about, you know, it'll be more Terrible for Sodom and Gomorrah than 
for you, those who rejected Jesus will have more judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah. So there, there are degrees of this wrath. We're just given a glimpse and we're warned. And if we really, really, really love people, if we really, really, really love them, we'll warn them about hell. If we really, really love them, we will teach out, we will teach out, and we will share the gospel. If we really, really love people, we will share the gospel. I just, I just one second. I know, I just want. We really, really love, if we really love people, we will. Um, we will share the gospel. So I hope that's been a blessing. I'm going to close in prayer. Lord, I just come before you today and I just confess my own failure and sin and my own weakness and confess my own hypocrisy, Lord, of a lack of love, pride. and Lord, I'm not walking the way one should, Lord, and I confess all my sin. But the most of all, Lord, what I confess I confess any sense that I might know better than you. I confess my lack of love for the lost, Lord. I confess, Lord, not fearing your greatness and your majesty. Oh, God, forgive me. Forgive us all, Lord. Forgive us all for our foolish ways and our blindness of heart. And oh Lord, thank you for saving us. Oh God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your salvation, Lord. Oh, that you've saved us. Oh Lord, have mercy. Help us not to walk in the ways of sin, but to love you and serve you, Lord. Pray for my brothers and sisters today that you bless them and those that I rebuke, have mercy upon them, Lord. And may we all walk in the ways of your kindness and love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A couple of resources. John Blanchard has written on Evangelical Press a book on the doctrine of hell. W. Shed, uh, Eternal Punishment. PDF you can get free. If you go on Monagism uh, and type in hell, there are articles there that you can read. And if you go to Sermon Audio, you can listen to a variety of lectures on the doctrine of hell. And particularly good is Almaty. I hope that's been a blessing. Solemn stuff. and Forgive me for my passion if it's gone too far. But um, my heart is sincere. Uh, I've been truly affected by this teaching today that I've been studying and I hope that it challenges you and makes you think and, and, and makes you to stand on the Word of God. God bless you.